everyone and thank you for joining me once again. Now it's time for something a little different this week. You'd usually see me down on the tidal River Thames foreshore searching for historical artefacts, but today we're going to take a look at one type of pottery I frequently find down on the riverbed. If you're a regular viewer, you'll be familiar with a number of pottery types I find, especially those real staples of the foreshore, such as London post-medieval redware, transfer wares, and salt glazed pottery, to name but a few. In this video series, I'll get a little more in depth with different types of commonly found pottery, setting out the historical context to see how these wares ended up on our shores. Now a quick disclaimer, I'm not a pottery expert, archaeologist or art historian. What I'm presenting to you is what I've learned through primary and secondary research over the years. If you have anything to add to this, or even have a conflicting fact or opinion, please feel free to start up a dialogue in the comments. It also bears mentioning that the subject of different pottery wares is vast, and this video is intended as a general overview of the subject. We are not getting into super fine detail here. However, I will add a suggested bibliography, helpful links and credits to those who've helped me in the video description. And don't forget, I'm still learning and that's a great thing. Now, without further ado, let's take a closer look at Tin Glazed Earthenwares with a focus on English Delft. Delftware, faience, myolica, it's all tin glazed pottery. But what exactly is tin glaze pottery? Put simply, tin glaze is a lead glaze with added tin oxide which produces a white, glossy, opaque finish when fired. This white glaze was almost certainly developed and used to mimic Chinese porcelain. Although some did have access to Chinese export porcelain, it was extremely expensive and only the very wealthy could afford it. Tin glazed wares imitated the clean white finish of porcelain, whilst also covering inconsistencies in the fabric body, that's porous, soft-bodied earthenware, which is usually either buff-coloured or red. In 1628, the London potter Christian Wilhelm of the Pickle Herring Pottery at St Olaf's in Southwark proudly stated that his tin glazed earthenware was as fair as china dishes. English Delftware is tin glazed pottery made in the British Isles between circa 1550 and the late 18th century. The main centres of production were London, Bristol and Liverpool, with smaller areas of production at Glasgow, Dublin and Wincanton. The generic term Delftware has long been used in the UK to describe tin glazed earthenware. However, English tin glazed wares used to be called galleyware and its makers galley potters, but more on that later. As you might already know, tin glazed wares can simply be pure white, as commonly found in humble everyday items such as apothecary jars. Yet what often springs to mind with tin glazed pottery are brightly decorated wares, blues, yellows, purples, greens, all achieved by adding further oxides to the glaze. So what of its application? How does the finished tin glazed ware end up with such lively colours and free flowing designs? Well, the white tin glaze is applied to an already fired body, which may then be further decorated with a number of colours. Often, one or more of the following colours was applied. Red, blue, yellow, green and purple. The additional colours were usually applied with brushes to the unfired white glaze surface. Bright colours were achieved by using metallic oxides, such as cobalt for blue, copper for green, iron for red, manganese for purple, and antimony for yellow. Once the decoration is finished, the ware is then fired a second time, at a lower temperature, indelibly fusing pigments and glaze. After this point, changes to the decoration cannot be made. 
Sometimes another transparent lead glaze is then applied and a third firing took place, but many English tin glazed wares did not apply the third firing process. So how do we identify a piece of tin glazed pottery shard? How do we know what it is when we find it? Let's take a look at some of my Thames found shards. The body is an earthenware fabric, yellowish to pinkish in colour. It is a soft fabric, and by that we mean it is porous, not hard and vitreous like stoneware, and is slightly biscuity to the touch. The glaze itself is very easy to spot. You can see a clear line of it, and in most cases it's likely to be cracked or chipped off in places. It might even be crazed or crackled, and this is because tin glaze is brittle and chips off easily. You might also notice some glazing faults, known as pinholes or pits. Pinholes are small holes in the glaze which penetrate down to the body. Pits are more like dimples which mar the surface but do not extend down to the body. A reminder of the colours, often a majority blue but you will find purples, yellows, reds, greens and, with pieces dated to a later timeline, polychrome designs which incorporated many other colours. English Delftware is harder and coarser than Dutch Delft, which is usually thinner, and you can see the differences in tiles here. If you would like to learn more about identifying pottery, particularly that which we find on the Thames, an invaluable and totally affordable digital resource is Richard Hemery's Identifying the Pottery of the Thames Foreshore. Link in the video description. Tin glazed wares were first conceived in Islamic countries and then made their way to European potteries, which is how they ended up in the British Isles. Let's see how that unfolded. The art of tin glazing is credited to the Assyrians and is said to have been revived in Mesopotamia during the 9th century. The earliest evidence of tin glazed pottery was found during World War I when pieces dated to the 9th century were excavated from the palace of Samara near Baghdad. The tin glazed pottery route spread from Iraq to Egypt, Persia, now Iran, and Moorish Spain, before heading over to Italy via the Spanish island of Majorca in the mid 15th century. From there it hit Holland in the 16th century and finally France, England and other European countries by the mid to late 16th century. Tin glazed wares were being used in some countries, such as Italy, as early as the 12th century, when it was first used for simple painted wares. They also appeared in England in the Middle Ages as imports. However, we're looking at the production route via immigrant and then native potters, therefore the generally accepted timeline covering all bases is as I have described. As you already know, there are many styles and names to describe tin glazed wares, and they do sometimes become a little muddled and confusing. So let's break that down by country and style. Starting with hispano moresque ware. One theory for the pattern of the spread of tin glazed wares is that as Islam grew in strength and popularity, pottery styles and methods also spread with it. From the Middle East to Muslim Spain, Al Andalus, which was conquered by the Moors in 711. The initial tin glazed wares of Muslim Spain are referred to as hispano moresque ware, which encompassed both decorated tin glaze and gold and silver luster wares. The designs of hispano moresque wares are generally distinguished from the pottery of Christendom by the Islamic character of its decoration. However, there was at times a blending or combination of styles which could be seen on some wares made for the Christian market. The production of tin glazed earthenware was at first centred in Malaga in the 13th and 14th centuries using typical Islamic decoration but by the 15th century the largest production was around Valencia which had long been reconquered by the Spanish crown of Aragon. Murcia and Almeria were also early centres of production Although the pottery styles didn't differ that much from those seen in other Islamic countries, they too were also exporting a fair amount to the Christian market. 
These pieces sometimes bore the addition of coats of arms, such as the examples you can see now on the screen. Wealthy Italians were among those who purchased some of these wares, replete with coats of arms, which brings us neatly on to Maiolica. After the expulsion of the Moors from Spain and the dwindling trade in hispano moresque wares, the Italians picked up the tin glaze baton and ran with it. Largely developed in imitation of the Spanish wares, the tin glazed wares in Italy became known as Maiolica and, in both style and design, were ambitious and prestigious. There are two notable theories for the name Maiolica. One, that it was a corruption of Mallorca, an important trade port between Spain and Italy. And two, as Daphne Carnegie, artist potter and author of the highly acclaimed Tin Glazed Earthenware and Maiolica, suggests the name may have derived from the Spanish Obra de Malaga, or Malaga work. By approximately 1410, the Italian tin glaze industry was established and by the end of the century was flourishing in places such as Faenza and Montelupo. Montelupo, by the end of the 16th century, seems to have obtained the monopoly of the Mediterranean Maiolica trade. From Italy, the fashion for decorated tin glaze was spreading throughout Europe. In the early 1500s, Italian potters, with an eye to new and developing markets, started to emigrate and set up workshops in Spain, France, Switzerland and Antwerp. One Italian potter, Guido Andres, from Castel Durante, had established a pottery in Antwerp around 1508. It's now known that Andres was actually one Guido di Savino, who adopted a Flemish name when relocating to Antwerp. Guido is largely credited with bringing tin glazed wares to Belgium. The spread doesn't end there though. In the second half of the 16th century, Guido's son, Jasper, played a leading role in taking the production technique of tin glazed earthenware from Antwerp to England. But before we head to England, let's take a look at French faience and Dutch Delftware from where English Delft took its name. Faience. Italian Maiolica particularly the much admired pottery made in Faenza, was, in the early 16th century, imitated in France. The name Faience, applied to works first made in France and later Spain, Scandinavia and Germany, was derived from Faenza. We're going to gracefully skirt somewhat around the F word, Faience, lest we trip right over it and lead us down many garden paths and rabbit holes, even as far as Egyptian Faience, which is not really Faience or even pottery at all. Straightforward, right? You see, Faience is attributed to many different styles of French painted tin glazed wares, confusingly not all of which are tin glazed. Despite lead glazed faience not properly qualifying as faience, as it is not actually tin glazed, the distinction is not always adhered to and, as I already stated, well, it's complicated. Under the tin glazed faience banner in France, we find various styles that vary from region to region, such as Quimper, Never and Rouen. Let's leave France now and go through the door marked Delftware before heading to England. Delftware. Remember the Italian potter I mentioned just earlier, Guido di Savino, the one largely credited with bringing Maiolica to Antwerp, Belgium, where he arrived circa 1508? Well, he settled in Antwerp, opened a Maiolica workshop and, as you do, had a family. Luckily for us, Guido's five, yes, five, sons also became potters and after Guido's death in 1541, continued the pottery business. But how do we get from Belgium to Holland? Thanks to competitive markets and the violently unstable religious and political situation at the time, from Antwerp, master manufacturers of tin glazed wares fled Belgium to the Netherlands. This was largely forced by tensions between Catholics and Protestants, which would result in the Spanish Fury already brewing in the 1560s and saw Protestant potters scattering from Belgium throughout the Netherlands to areas like Harlem and Delft. With them went the Andrews potters, who settled near Delft. 
apart from two sons, Jasper and Joris, who relocated to Norwich, England. Production of tin glazed wares continued and developed, and although much of the finest work was produced in Delft, by the 1580s production of everyday wares had spread to Gouda and Amsterdam, amongst other places. Maiolica was the main influence on the decorative styles of Dutch Delftware, also known as Delft Blue. Chinese porcelain, of which during the Dutch Golden Age, the Dutch East India Company was importing literally boatloads of, was also a huge influence. Delftware inspired by Chinese originals started in the 1620s, following a temporary halt to the flow of imported porcelain, following the death of the Wan Li Emperor. Professor Christian Jörg of the British Museum, in his book Oriental Export Porcelain and Delftware, states that, because of this interruption in porcelain imports, potters now saw an opportunity to produce a cheap alternative for Chinese porcelain. After much experimenting, they managed to make a thin type of earthenware which was covered with a white tin glaze. Although made of low-fired earthenware, it resembled porcelain amazingly well. Chinese-inspired Delftware continued well into the mid-18th century. It goes without saying that we must mention the vast number of Delftware tiles that Dutch potters made, estimated at 800 million over a period of 200 years. A small bibliography for these facts and figures will be in the video description. Now, on to our main subject, English Delftware. In the 1598 Survey of London, John Stowe summarises the introduction of tin glazed earthenware to England. About the year 1567, Jasper Andres and Jacob Janssen, potters, came away from Antwerp to avoid the persecution there and settled in Norwich, where they followed their trade, making galley paving tiles and vessels for apothecaries and others very artificially. Anno 1570, they moved to London. Documentary research backs up John Stowe's statement. As mentioned earlier, it was religious persecution by the Spanish in Flanders that drove potters abroad from Antwerp in the 1560s. Huguenot refugees headed to Protestant Holland and England, and among those were Jasper and Joris Andries, the sons of Guido Andries, previously de Savino, having first settled in Antwerp. Jasper and Joris arrived in the English city of Norwich around 1567, and this was noted in the Norwich Diocesan archives. Ceramic historian Frank Britton felt the potters favoured first settling in Norwich due to the presence of good red clay. It also didn't hurt that the Duke of Norfolk and members of the London Dutch Church had invited refugees from the Low Countries to settle in Norwich. According to Archer and Morgan, the wares they were producing at that time were reminiscent of Italian tin-glazed earthenware and consisted of plates, tiles, drug jars and altar vases. So they were doing well, despite a petition to the Queen made by influential gentlemen from Lincolnshire and Northamptonshire, including Thomas Cecil, Francis Harrington and Richard Bertie, stating their concern of encouraging alien craftsmen in England. Jasper Andrews and the Potters continued to plough their furrow nonetheless, and later presented their own petition to the Queen to request the granting of a patent for the production of tin-glazed earthenware. Later, Jacob Janssen, or Jacob Johnson, Jasper's pottery workshop partner, arrives in England and the group of potters move to London. Further proof of their settling in London is this petition to Queen Elizabeth I between 1570 and 1571, which claims that they were the first to practice tin glazing in England and wanted the sole right to practice galley potting in London. Now to London. There is a record of Jacob Janssen, Jacob Johnson, working in Duke's Place, Oldgate, where he is listed as a pot maker, along with six other foreign potters. This Oldgate pottery is of great importance in the history of English tin glazed earthenware. 
It was the first of a number of similar potteries set up in London, which led to a flourishing industry. The Oldgate Pottery continued after Janssen's death in 1592 until 1615 when one or two other tin glazing potteries were started at Montague Close and Pickle Herring, both in the borough of Southwark. London saw a thriving tin glazed earthenware industry and potteries were starting to pop up in other locations in England, including Bristol and Liverpool in the late 17th and early 18th centuries. They also spread to Ireland and Scotland, with potteries opening at Belfast, Dublin and Glasgow around the same time. London Potteries In their book, London's Delftware Industry, the tin glazed potteries of Lambeth and Southwark, its authors, Tyler Betts and Stevenson, state that the tin glaze industry of London was a remarkably homogenous one. The pot houses were manufacturing much the same range of products as each other. They go on to say that the ceramics of the London pot houses are virtually indistinguishable from each other in terms of clay fabric alone, not surprising given their common access to clay sources. A large repertoire of wares were being produced, everyday items including tiles, mugs, drug jars, dishes, wine bottles, posset pots, porringers, salt pots, candlesticks and flower bricks. Large decorative dishes, often called chargers, were incredibly popular. And this is where we saw the major part of the most ambitious painting, stretching artists to the very edge of their capabilities, and then some. Listen to this amusing quote taken from Kager Smith's Tin Glazed Pottery in Europe about the decoration on a particular style of charger, the so-called blue dash charger, named thus because of the slanting blue dashes on the rim, with the ever popular biblical theme of Adam, Eve and the serpent. The challenge of rendering the anatomy of Adam and Eve was inescapable. And as the subject became more and more freely repeated by painters of less and less competence, most of the anatomy gave trouble, particularly Adam's abdominal muscles, which eventually became grotesque and could not be wholly covered by his fig leaf. And on later wares, he goes on to say, the images had declined to the level of coloured graffiti. Adam and Eve were cave dwellers. The tree had become a mere cipher and only the serpent and the fruit proved simple enough to survive debasement. I don't know about you, but I would have loved to own one of the Adam and Eve horrors. They sound fantastic. Let's take a further look at chargers. Blue dash chargers measured approximately 25 to 35 centimeters in diameter, with a variety of decoration, including abstract, floral, religious and patriotic designs and were produced in quantity by London and Bristol potters until the early 18th century. Charges were kept for decoration, living on walls, dresses and tables. Because of this, a number have survived and we are fortunate enough to see complete examples in museum collections. The Museum of London holds the earliest known piece with an English inscription dated 1600 and the words The rose is red, the leaves are green, God save Elizabeth our Queen. Its decoration is extravagant, painted in blue, purple, green, orange and yellow, and depicts the Tower of London and Old London Bridge. It is surrounded with an Italianate border of masks and leaves. The rim is decorated with dashes of blue and is considered the first in a series of large decorated blue dash chargers. You can see here some lovely colour on two large pieces of charger that I found on the foreshore. Other interesting items being produced were fuddling cups, ale mugs joined in groups of three, four or five with connecting holes to confuse the drinker and puzzle jugs, similar in their imaginative playfulness to fuddling cups. Now these are my personal favourites, as well as chargers, posset pots and candlesticks. Here are some gorgeous examples on the screen now. In the toiletry and healthcare department, we see the production of barber's bowls, pill slabs and bleeding bowls. 
Also, practical and essential undecorated items included chamber pots and small disposable ointment pots, galley pots, dispensed by apothecaries. So, you've caught that name now a few times. The alternative name for ointment pots, that was galley pots. I said at the beginning we'd return to this strange name. During the 16th and 17th centuries, tin-glazed earthenware potters were actually called galley pot makers, all one word, and their pottery wares were known as galley pots or galley wares. We are not certain exactly when this term originated, but one helpful record is a 1658 will of one Robert Bennett, potter of Brislington, which describes him as a galley pot maker. So what about the why? Why galley pots? We have two explanations. The first is from the legendary Ivan Noel Hume, who in 1977 suggested that the term galley pot was a reference to the galleys of ships that first imported Italian maiolicas. Another source suggests it's more likely that the use of the term came from Flanders, where, according to Frank Britton, the makers of tin glazed earthenware were known as Galea's Potbackers. Not sure if I pronounced that correctly, but there we are, Galea's Potbackers. Now, let's take a look at my two largest fragments of tin glazed pottery that I just showed you a minute ago when we were talking about chargers. These two pieces here are certainly made at one of the Southwark tin glazed workshops and possibly produced at a particular pothouse established by Thomas Barnbow, circa 1638, with his apprentice William Fry and later partner Joseph Muston. This pothouse produced a range of tin glazed earthenware vessels, including chargers, plates, dishes, bowls, drug jars, wine bottles, goblets, posset pots, embossed mugs, cordial cups, salts and porringers. The Victoria and Albert Museum has a number of pieces by this same pothouse. Images on the screen now. If we take a further look at the decorative styles of English pottery, we see that although it's similar in many respects to Dutch Delftware, its Englishness certainly comes through. Kager Smith describes its mood as ingenious, direct, sometimes eccentric, and Garner talks of its quite distinctive character. Now, I think this is a polite way of saying that our methods and techniques were more, hmm, rustic than those of our continental counterparts. Daphne Carnegie comments that there is a relaxed tone and a sprightliness which is preserved throughout the history of English Delftware. The overriding mood is provincial and naive, rather than urbane and sophisticated. And there's something about this that I just love. It seems so very British. A sense of not over-egging the pudding. And job done, as my dad might say. I mean, why go that extra unnecessary mile? A third glaze? I don't think so. English tinglaze potters rarely use the transparent overglaze applied by the more sophisticated Dutch and Italians, and the enamels so popular on the continent in the 18th century were only here for a short period of time. At Liverpool, where so-called Fazakali wares were made, Fazakali being an area of Liverpool for those who don't know. So, to sum up, we know that the London Delftware industry hit the ground running circa 1570 at Oldgate and post-1615 to 1620, tin glazed ware pot houses opened in London with increasing frequency, with a strong presence south of the River Thames. Documentary and archaeological evidence combined shows us that there were tin glazed production sites on the Thames, including Montague Close, Pickle Herring, Rotherhithe, Norfolk House and Glasshouse Street. We know that all the pot houses were making very similar, if not identical, wares, so narrowing down fragments to their individual pot houses was difficult, although in some cases it is possible. An abundance of wares were made, and towards the end of the 17th century, tastes were changing. Out went the apothecary pots, tiles and large fancy dishes. In came the less fussily decorated polite tableware, 
ornaments, punch bowls and tea, coffee and cocoa pots. This changing taste was also reflected by the use of chinoiserie decorations and polychrome palettes. It's generally accepted that the Glasshouse Street Pothouse was probably the last in London to produce tin glaze wares, which they did until 1784. So what happened to London's Delftware industry? Well, a rise in popularity of lead-glazed earthenwares and Chinese export porcelain, which was becoming much more available and affordable, is largely to blame. But it was the discovery and development of creamware by Josiah Wedgwood that really hammered the final nail in the coffin of tin-glazed wares. Creamware was a very white and durable earthenware. It could be produced with a clear lead glaze and the result of which was pottery that was lighter and more durable than tin glazed ware. Decoration could be applied at the bisque stage using printed transfers. You can see where this is all heading. The introduction of these new wares and industrial techniques that disadvantaged the Delft ware makers meant that, by the 19th century, tin glazed earthenware had all but died out until its revival in the form of studio art pottery a hundred years later. However, there are exceptions. It is well worth noting that, during the Victorian era and into the 20th century, Thanks to William Morris and the Arts and Crafts movement, and William de Morgan, there was both a mini-boom in tin-glazed earthenware in the form of imported Dutch Delft tiles, and also in the case of de Morgan, the resurrection of firing luster on tin glaze, which he had rediscovered and executed to an impeccable standard. Despite industrialization and the mass manufacture of tiles in the Victorian period, Morris & Co imported much, and while not true arts and crafts, Delftware tiles are often found in arts and crafts homes. The Ravistian factory incorporated arts and crafts designs into their export ware for the British market. This Dutch-made tile fragment here, which I recently found, dates from circa 1900 to 1930, and it's most likely made by the Van Holst family of Harlingen. This identification was made by the Dutch author and Delft tile expert Jan Plus. Huge thanks to him for that. Another proponent of Victorian tin glazed earthenware was Mintens, who from 1848 to circa 1880 created tin glazed pottery, an imitation of Maiolica in both process and style. Now this is the stuff we call Majolica, although the name has also been attributed to other wares incorrectly. In 1852, Leon Arnoux, artistic and technical director of Mintons, described exactly what they meant by Majolica. We understand by Majolica a pottery formed of a calcareous clay, gently fired and covered with an opaque enamel composed of sand, lead and tin. Minton's Majolica was admired and purchased by only the very wealthy. It made little commercial impact, despite being a success at exhibitions. Cost of production was high, the work was time-consuming and required expert, and therefore higher-paid, artists. Other potters shunned the revival of this old-fashioned process and, as already stated, interest in older pottery styles was on the wane. Interesting to note that at this point, because of new industrialised production methods, the once celebrated tin glazed wares that included both humble, everyday pieces and extravagantly decorated wares now were not only a chore to make, but it also made no sense to spend money on its production. Present day. Changes in the formulation of tin glaze meant that artist potters began to work in the medium. The revival of pottery making saw important studios opening up, such as the Bloomsbury Artist Mega Workshops in London in the 1920s. In Orvieto and Deruta, Italy, traditionally both important areas of tin glaze ceramics, a revival in tin glazed wares had started at the beginning of the 20th century. Over in the south of France in the 1940s and 50s, we've got Picasso who was designing and producing tin glazed pottery. So what of Dutch Delft? 
Well, amongst others, the pottery Royal Chichala Makum continues the production of Delftware using tin glazed earthenware, as well as the Harlinger art pottery and tile makers in Harlingen. There are also a number of modern day tile decorators working on restoration projects, such as Francis Ceramics, who recently completed a restoration project based on a small pot shard of tin glaze ware dating to early 18th century Rotterdam, found in a fireplace. Back to Britain, at the Central School of Arts and Crafts, we had Dora Billington, who was encouraging her students, including Alan Kager Smith, to use tin glaze decoration. Kager Smith, the name I keep coming back to along with others, opened the rye pottery and going against the trend at the time, the 1950s, for stoneware pottery, continued making with tin glaze. He worked extensively with tin glazed wares and experimented with the technique of reducing luster on tin glaze which had been forgotten since circa 1800. Kager Smith trained several potters at his Older Marston Pottery and published Tin Glazed Pottery, from which I have quoted in this video several times, which gives a comprehensive history of Maiolica, Delftware and Fayence in Europe and the Islamic world. Another important book which I have mentioned and referenced in this video, Tin Glazed Earthenware by Daphne Carnegie. To bring us right up to the present day, Tin glazed wares are of course still produced, and if you've been lucky enough to ever visit Faenza or take a trip to Mexico or various regions of France or even Caltagirone in Sicily, you might have bought souvenir pieces of tin glazed pottery to bring back home. To this day, a number of artists are working to produce tin glazed wares, including Daphne Carnegie, whose information I have included in the video description, along with links to other artists and potters working with tin glaze. I hope you've enjoyed this, my first foray into explaining a little more about the pottery we find on the River Thames foreshore. The next time you see me, I'll probably be back rootling around on the foreshore, but I will have another Pottery Pieces video for you again soon. Thanks as ever for watching and subscribing. Until the next time, take care everyone.